start to turn our Bibles, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3. And tonight we're going to uh, continue and uh, finish uh, the lesson that I had prepared on Sunday. We may end up a little early this uh, this evening, but probably not. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, I want to get through uh, verse 4 for you this evening. And then on Thursday, we're going to come back and wrap it up with verses uh, 5 and 6, as far as I know at this point. So unless the Holy Spirit has something else in mind. But in any case, uh, we continue to note Luke chapter 21, our Lord prophesying in regard to his second advent, prophesying about the great uh, persecution and martyrdom that can come to the church and also to the tribulational saints. So that has led us into the understanding of the tribulational time period. And then within that seven-year time period, the fifth of the seven sealed judgments, which is that great martyrdom of the saints during the tribulational time period. And so we've been noting in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, that fifth seal judgment, where there will be great martyrdom, but also we see the promise of great blessing for those who are faithful throughout their lives until the end. And that now has led us to various analogies and typology of what this fifth seal judgment is all about. And we are on the third point in regard to this, where we're looking at the fifth of the sevenfold message to the seven churches found in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, sometimes called the seven letters to the seven churches. But in the other analogies, we'll be noting those over the next week or so, uh, probably starting on Sunday. Uh, but we'll note the fifth of the seven of each of those categories as it gives us more information about this great fifth seal judgment so that we can have better understanding towards it. But in regard to that, we have the sevenfold message to the seven churches in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, that uh, was announced in Revelation chapter 1 in verse 11. So let's read that, and then we'll get into uh, the completion of verse 4 this evening, where we begin to talk about the great blessings uh, for the positive believer, the winner believer, going forward in the plan of God. So in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, To the angel, the pastor, of the church in Sardis, who has the seven spirits of God, that's the God the Holy Spirit, and the seven stars, or the seven pastors to the seven churches, he says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name or you have a reputation, that you are alive. They were spiritually born again. They had a good reputation as a church because of their past history, but now you are dead. Again, they're walking in spiritually dead works. They're performing human good works. They're no longer going after the Word of God as they used to and applying that within their lives. And now they're just getting into the feel-good nature of human good works and doing the churchy church thing rather than really having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're alive. They're spiritually born again, but they are dead. They're believers, but they're not walking in the will and plan of God. So in verse 2, he says, wake up. Wake up from your spiritual slumber, as it were, your spiritual deadness, even though they positionally were spiritually alive. It says, and strengthen the things that remain. The Bible doctrine, the little bit that they have in their soul, and the faith that they had at least to believe in Jesus Christ and continue to participate in the local assembly. He says these things which are about to die. So these things, if they didn't wake up from their spiritual slumber, they would lose all of them. And we even noted how God would take them out under a, uh, the third stage of divine discipline if they did not wake up and they instead stayed in their reversionism. He says, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. He still had more for them to do. Verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard heard, and we would add the Word of God, Bible doctrine, and keep it. Guard that within your soul. Don't let anybody take it. Don't let sin and Satan and the influence of the cosmic system steal that doctrine away from your soul. And even the things that you do learn, again, the world can rip that out of your soul by uh, getting you uh, occupied with other things so that you don't retain and recall the Word of God on a consistent basis. So we have a responsibility to guard our soul through the uh, 
uh, power of God the Holy Spirit. Then it says, and repent. Change your way of direction, change your mode of operation, and get back into the plan of God. Then he gives a warning, if therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. <clears throat> And this, first and foremost, harkens back to where it says, which, which were about to die. It first harkens to the, uh, the brevity of when the Lord would come into their life, unbeknownst to them, and then bring about divine discipline, trying to wake them up. And uh, if they don't wake up, even taking the third stage of divine discipline and ending their physical life, bringing them home in a dishonorable discharge, as we like to call it, uh, where they don't glorify God, to the maximum for all of eternity. So I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come. That also gives us the analogy of the resurrection or the rapture of the church because we have those same two phrases, a thief and an hour, when you do not know for the rapture of the church. But even that, if they are walking spiritually dead, they're not going to be prepared for the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're not going to be uh, prepared for the Bema seat of Jesus Christ that happens in heaven during the tribulation when our works are judged. And if we are judged in our works that are found to be human good, we will lose the rewards that God had designed for us. But if they are de deemed divine good, the fruit of the Spirit, we will be blessed for all of eternity in an even more fantastic way. So that's what that is all about. Then we get into verse 4, which we began on Sunday and we'll finish up tonight. It says, but you have a few people or a few names or a few with good reputations is how we should be saying that in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. And the word for soiled, as we noted, is defiled. They have not uh, messed up their holiness and righteousness. They continue to walk in holiness and righteousness. They continue to produce the fruit of the Spirit. They are spiritually clean. Uh, before the, uh, our Lord experientially. They are going forward inside the plan of God. But you have a few in Sardis who have not soiled their garments as the many have is the analogy that our Lord is giving. It says, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. And then it says, he who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. We'll note all of that on Thursday. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as you understand, because these uh, believers in Sardis the majority of them were not walking filled with the Holy Spirit. The majority were not operating uh, through the Word of God. They weren't participating in their local assembly. They weren't hungry uh, for the intake and application of the Word of God as they used to be. So therefore, this is a wake-up call for them. But there are a few, as in many of our churches, there are always a few who are going forward in the plan of God, who are fervent for the uh, Bible doctrine, the intake, and then the application. They are uh, uh, workers within the church. They're helping provide for the church and also the outreach of the church to the lost and dying. There are a few who typically are doing that in each and every church. Sometimes there's a lot of people doing that in a church. Sometimes there are just a few like the church at Sardis. But because they were walking by the flesh, the many, and not by the spirit, they were not producing divine good, but these few people were. And God used the negative as a further wake-up call, soiling the garments for those who are walking in their spiritual slumber, but ultimately it's a positive for the few because they weren't doing that. They were continuing to walk in the holiness and righteousness of God, performing the will and plan of God, producing divine good, and therefore our Lord will bless them. There was the fivefold admonition to these negative believers in verses 2 and 3. And now in verse 4, we see the com commendation to the winner believers, the overcomers, as we call it, those who were going forward in the plan of God. And with that, we see the promises of blessing once again. 
Now, as we uh, go through these this evening and also on Thursday night, and we note the uh, various blessings that are promised to the winner believer, I also want to draw your attention that you could also look at these passages, and really in all seven letters, when it talks about the overcomer, it's speaking about all believers, because in one form or fashion, everyone who believes in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is an overcomer. And what are they an overcomer from? Sin and Satan and the eternal condemnation through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit because of the cross of Jesus Christ and his accomplishment there. So when you read these things, you can say, well, this is for all believers, okay? Because we're all overcomers because Jesus is really the one who won the strategic victory of the angelic conflict, and anyone who believes upon him gets credit for that victory. And we are saved from sin and Satan and certainly the eternal lake of fire. And we will be given eternal life. But as I've been explaining and as we uh, go through these things, we also see a difference for those believers being different from other believers. And again, I just hearken back to uh, 1 Corinthians where it talks about the resurrection body and how it says star will differ from star. So will be the resurrection of the church, okay? We will all have different forms of glorification of God in the eternal state. And what determines the difference of our glorification is what we do here on planet Earth in time. Did we walk through the power and the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, taking in the Word of God consistently and applying it? If so, we will be bright as the sun in the eternal state, maximum glorification towards God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if we didn't do those things and just believed in Jesus Christ and then didn't go forward in the plan of God for whatever reason or fell into reversionism and outright apostasy at some point in our lives, remember, we do not lose our salvation. We have eternal security. We'll even talk more about that uh, probably on Thursday night as well. But for those believers, they won't glorify God to the maximum, and they're going to be missing out on blessings and rewards in the eternal state. So as we read these things, we talk about the overcomer and the blessing that goes for them. Many of these things you would say, well, that's every believer. They all get that. Well, they'll get maybe this bit of it, but the believer will get, the positive believer will get much, much more as a result. Some of these things are clearly differentiated for just the winner believers, the overcomers of all believers. Others we can see as a baseline for all believers as we go through it. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a small minority of winner believers in the church of Sardis at this time who stood firm for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They picked up and put on the full armor of God. They were withstanding the flaming arrows of the flaming missiles of the evil one, Satan and his cosmic system. They did not give over to the lusts of the flesh and give over to the pagan religions that were very enticing with the lusts of sexuality time and time again. They did not give over to those things. They did not give over to the ways of the world. Instead, they stood firm, they stood strong, they kept going forward in the plan of God, and they kept professing Jesus Christ, they kept witnessing the gospel, and they kept learning and growing each and every day. They went against the trends of everyday society inside of Satan's cosmic system and were faithful to God at, at this point in time and remained that way throughout their life. And how many times do we read for the uh, winner believer or the overcomer? If you are faithful to the end, okay, to the end. And that's what we need to do. Continue to be faithful until the time that the Lord takes us home. And if we do that and we remain faithful, go forward in his plan, we are going to be blessed incredibly in the eternal state. And again, we can compare that in Revelation 16, 15 and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. So now when we get to the blessings here, it says, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white. 
for they are worthy. And those are the two uh, aspects of blessing that we see here. One, they're going to walk in white. And then in verse 5, it talks about white garments. So we see the analogy of the uniform of glory. We've noted that a little bit already. We're going to note it a little bit more on Thursday night because the white garment comes into play in verse 5. But we recognize walking in white with our Lord. Now remember, white within the scripture also means holiness and righteousness. And if you walk in the holiness and righteousness of God in time, you're going to have a more intimate, personal, and close relationship with the holiness and righteousness of our Lord in the eternal state. And as I've uh, given you the example of the 12 apostles, how uh, three of them typically were called forward amongst the other nine, they had a more close, personal, and intimate relationship defined for us within the scriptures of all the 12. Nine of them, they were there, okay? But three were always in the most close and intimate times with Jesus at the Transfiguration, and we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus prayed, and he went a little bit further, then he prayed. He went a little bit further, then he prayed. He went a little bit further, then he prayed. And by the time he got to the end of that, he only had, again, uh, three of the disciples the closest of his disciples with him at that point in time where the other nine were just a little bit further behind so too will it be in the eternal state we're all going to have a great relationship with our lord and savior jesus christ but the winner believer is going to be more intimately involved with our lord each and every day with all his decisions with all his judging with all his actions and probably with all his continued creations because our lord is a creator and you don't and don't think that you know what we have in the creation of the universe today is all that he's going to do again we're going to be around for eternity our lord is a creator he loves to create and we are going to witness creation after creation after creation in inimaginable forms, uh, uh, fashions, sizes, and whatever else you can think. And even beyond what you're able to think. And oh, by the way, there's probably going to be responsibility that comes towards all of those various creations that we church age believers will have the uh, opportunity to, uh, 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 to officiate over during the eternal state. So again, you know, uh, we recognize the close, intimate relationship that we have with our Lord. And if we have that in time, we're going to have that in eternity. And that's what it means, they will walk with me in white. Yes, the winner believer receives a uniform of glory, but that's going to be a signification of the great responsibilities that they also have in the eternal state. And again, on Thursday, we're going to come back because there's more definition to that when we get to verse 5. But then we see the next uh, uh, par uh, phrase here, which is, for they are worthy. And the word worthy in the Greek is axios, and it does mean worthy. It means they're deserving, they're fit, they are good enough, as it were. And again, uh, 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 similar types of translations as we bring it into the English. So being deemed worthy is a very important aspect of our spiritual walk. And before I get in, into any more depth of that, we also recognize right off the bat that our worthiness is not based on our human powers, our human resources, or our human assets. Again, it really has nothing to do with us, even though we are the ones to be deemed worthy. You see, our worthiness comes from our relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our worthiness comes from the non-meritorious act of faith in God, in His Word, in Jesus Christ, and the God, the Holy Spirit, to empower and enable us each and every day. And you see, the more we trust and rely and apply faith in all that there is that God has given to us, the more worthy we will be deemed. Okay, So our worthiness comes from divine power, divine assets, and God working within our lives when we allow Him to do so. And there's a word that we can uh, use in the English that really speaks volume to this other than faith, and it's called yielding. Yielding your soul, yielding your mental attitude, yielding your life to what? 
God and His Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, you have to yield. And again, hopefully you all know what yielded. Massachusetts, we don't know what yielding means too much, okay? You know, we got these signs where you, uh, you know, so they got a highway this way and you get a road that's merging in. And it says yield on the one merging in. Well, why is it that the people that are merging in seem to have the right of way all the time, okay? And they just bomb their way in and they, you know, they get in front of everybody that they should be yielding to, okay? Well, again, that's just a microcosm of the mental attitude of the soul of people. I mean, they're not yielding to the direct path, the direct highway, the high road, as it says in the book of Psalm and the Old Testament, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, we need to yield to His leading. We need to yield to His direction. And we're just getting on to the same path that Jesus is on. That's what our yielding is. You see, the highway is the highway. We're just getting on to the highway. And we're yielding to the authority of that highway when we enter on to it. So again, the same goes for our spiritual life. We need to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to yield to the Word of God. And rather than thinking that I've got all the answers, I've got all the knowledge, I've got all the wisdom, I've got all the resources and assets, I've got all the brains, I've got all the power, and it's all about me and how good of a person I can be. No, we need to yield to our Lord. When we do, we are deemed worthy. And that's what these positive believers, these winner believers in Sardis, the few that he's talking about, had as their mental attitude, and as a result, they were deemed to be worthy, for they are worthy. So as we uh, flush this worthiness out, and I'm going to show you some scriptures that uh, uh, compare to this as well, we recognize that those who walk with our Lord in this life will be counted worthy to continue that relationship with Him in the eternal life. And as I said, having the uniform of glory, wearing the various crowns that are also, uh, one is found in the seven letters to the churches, but others are found uh, within the New Testament. Wearing those crowns are going to signify some form of authority and responsibility and relationship with our Lord for all of eternity. And those who receive these rewards are deemed worthy because they did what? They yielded to the will and plan of God. They yielded to their faith rest with God rather than keeping themselves, uh, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Uh, rather than thinking that it's my knowledge of Bible doctrine and my good works and my service that I'm going to do. Rather than being self-motivated, they are yielding to the will and plan of God and looking for His lead and direction in all that they do whether it be at the home, on the job, within the church, or within the community. Again, yield to what God wants you to do, rather than going out and saying, I'm going to go do this. No, yield to what God has for you, and walk in that, and walk faithfully. And as you then, you know, and, and the other thing about, you know, you got the highway going down, you got the, the road that needs to yield on, okay, and you yield for that highway, okay, then what happens when you get on the highway? You better speed up. You better get going because you've got to now keep up with the highway. You see, the back road speed that you were going on is no longer any good. You've got to go much faster now because you've got to now go in the lane that is the fast lane. You've got to be on the highway that is God. You've got to be on the high road that is the word and will of God. And how do you do that? Well, you get to the high path of the high knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You understand His holiness, you understand His righteousness, and you function and you operate in that each and every day. And now you exert your effort and your faith to the will and plan that God has for you. So again, yielding, you get on, you merge on, but now once you're on, now you've got to get going. And you've got to get in that plan of God, and now you've got to move as the rest of those who are on the highway are moving. And don't lag behind. And don't be at the speed that you were, you know, on the back road, the country road, or the, the, the path that you were walking on. Now you've got to get onto that highway and operate and function in that mode. 
and do it with great diligence. So again, as we do, it represents our relationship with our Lord here on planet Earth. We're getting onto the highway. We're getting onto God's plan, God's will, operating in His holiness and His righteousness. We're no longer producing uh, human good and uh, living in the sin and functioning in the sin and operating in that that we used to or that we enjoy or had enjoyed. Now we're doing things the way God would do things and have us do things. Now we're functioning and operating according to His will and plan. If we do that in this time, we'll be doing that in the eternal state. If you can keep up with God now, you'll be able to keep up with Jesus in the eternal state. As you have a great relationship with Him, and He now is leading you and giving you great responsibilities and authority and power in the eternal state. Again, did even Paul said, don't you know that in the eternal state we'll be judging angels? That's just one other form of created being that we will have power and authority over. Again, vested in us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And who knows, as I said, what other creations are going to come down uh, over the eons of centuries uh, and, and uh, uh, millennia that are to come. And so because these winter believers in Sardis have continued to turn away from sin and Satan and his cosmic system and get on that highway of God's plan and be led by the filling of God the Holy Spirit, they now are producing divine good, the fruit of the Spirit. And because they're producing divine good, now the things that they do are rewardable and they can be blessed in the eternal state as a result of doing those things. Why? Because they have been deemed worthy, worthy to receive those things. You see, when we stand before the Bema seat of Jesus Christ, as 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 10 through 15 tells us, some of our works will be wood, hay, and straw, burnt up. No lasting rewards. But other things will be gold, silver, and precious gems that just get refined and are even better as they pass through the fire of judgment. Those things we will have lasting for all of eternity. Yes, we're using material objects, but it's really talking about the blessings that God has for us in the eternal state. That we don't even know what all the form and fashion of that will be as of yet. But because we've been deemed worthy here in the eternal state when we stand before the judgment seat of jesus christ we will again be deemed worthy to receive the gold silver and the precious gems of the eternal rewards that god has waiting for us from eternity past but if we are deemed unworthy we will have shame as we've talked about and we will lose out on the potential of those blessings that god had designed for us Therefore, Jesus judges us and he judges them and their deeds as being worthy of eternal rewards. And that's what these few winner believers are deemed. They're deemed worthy and they can receive those war rewards because they have fulfilled God's will and plan for their life. You see, the first time that this uh, word in the Greek, axios, for worthy, is used is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, which says, Therefore, bear fruit. And then in English it says, in keeping with repentance. Okay? Kind of lose a little bit of the flavor there, don't you? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Okay? Instead, it should be bear fruit that is worthy or deserving of the repentance that you have been given. You see, worthy of repentance means you have recognized at some point in your life that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. You've recognized that only Jesus Christ and His completed work on the cross is the thing that can bring salvation to you and the forgiveness of your sins. You've recognized that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for your sins and through Him you have eternal life. You've recognized that doing things according to the way of the world isn't going to get you anywhere. And it certainly isn't going to get you into heaven. You've realized that. You've recognized that. And with that knowledge and recognition, you've said, I'm changing my mind. I'm no longer going to live by the ways and means of this world. I am now going to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And because you made that change of mind, you have repented. That's what repentance means. We've talked about that. You've changed your mind and your mode of operation. So we did it for salvation, 
Now the exhortation is continue to do it for the spiritual life. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of the decision and the change of mode of operation you have already made. That's what this is all about. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance or bear fruit worthy of the repentance that you have already made and decided on within your life. Unfortunately for many people, yes, they believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but for whatever reason, they don't want to go beyond that, and they go right back into the world. Or maybe after a little bit of time dabbling in Christianity, where they did truly believe in Jesus Christ, they dabble back into the world, and they get caught up in the ways and modes and means and operations of this world. Okay? For those individuals they're not going to be deemed worthy to receive the blessings and rewards in the eternal state. They're going to be saved. They're going to be in heaven. They're going to receive a resurrection body. But the greater blessings they're going to lose out on. And anything that they did do in this life will be burnt up wood, hay, and straw. No lasting value to it whatsoever. But when they did things worthy of their repentance and they bore fruit, which means the fruit of the Spirit, divine good production, those things will be rewarded in the eternal state. And this word is then used extensively throughout the New Testament, including several passages that I'm going to show you now. Where in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians, it says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Okay? So that's the same thing as saying the repentance. Okay? Remember, when we repented which was the day that we believed in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Leading up to that was the calling of God saying, hey, come to me, come to me. Receive my uh, salvation for you. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the calling. And Paul in the book of Ephesians is saying, you have accepted the call. Now work worthy of the calling by which you have been called. Again, the salvation by which you have been given. Then we see in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, it says, Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy. Again, we see the worthiness again of the gospel of Christ. Again, going back to repentance, salvation, what you believed upon there, let the things continue to operate and function in your life that are worthy of that repentance that you have received. And again, just think about that for a little bit. And that's a good memory jog for us to do, you know, time and time again. Think about what Jesus did for you on the cross. The suffering, the torment, and the, the agony that he went through to pay for your sins upon the cross. To receive the penalty of your sins upon the cross so you would not have to. Okay? Think about the suffering and torture that he went through in order for you to receive what you have received. And then ask yourself, am I living a life up to that standard? Am I living a life worthy of what Jesus did for me on the cross? Or am I living in sin? Am I living in the cosmic system? Am I living in the world? Am I living for myself? Am I really living up to the standard of what Jesus has done for me? The exhortation, conduct yourself in a manner so worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, and that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So a little bit of definition of the worthiness and how to stand uh, and, and be considered worthy. But it all has to do with the fact of, are we living up to the standard of Jesus crucified for our sins? Then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. Again, see all those things? True, honorable, right, pure, lovely. And then whatever is of good repute. Gives you a good reputation. Remember the names that we've been seeing here in Sardis? Those who have a good name, a good reputation? It says, if there is anything, ex uh, uh, excuse me, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. 
So think about those things that are honorable, that are right, that are good, that are pure, that are lovely, and that ultimately are excellent. Dwell upon th those things, and you will be worthy of praise. Think about that. Let's turn our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Let's go to the, the book of Colossians. So just go back a little bit in the New Testament, but certainly after the books of Ephesians and Philippians. And as we look at Colossians chapter 1 and verses 9 through 12, we're in verse 9. It says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul's basically saying we're praying that you are filled with the word of God, Bible doctrine, in your soul with the ability to wield that doctrine in your life. Then in verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Again, worthy of your God, your Savior, your Creator, worthy of him. Worthy of what he accomplished for you upon the cross. Then it says to please him in all respects. Bearing fruit, again, divine good production in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, we never arrive. There's always more to learn. And I don't care how many times you've read one verse, read it again. Because you'll get something new out of it. You'll learn something more. It will just click in like never before. And then when you compare Scripture with Scripture, you know, you read this verse five years ago, but now you've got all these other Scriptures you've read. Then you go back to this one verse, you're going to say, oh, that's what's there. Oh, it's this much more. Oh, that's what that's what's saying. Now I understand putting all this together with that verse. Now it all comes together. Again, you'll always have more, increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might. Again, the power and might of God, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Word. And then for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Again, having the peace of God in your life. And then joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of of the saints in light. So again, here's what God is asking us to do, to be filled with all these things so that we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, so that we have the power of God, we apply the power of God, we have the peace of God, we apply the peace of God, we have hap the happiness of God, joy and peace and contentment in our soul, and we rejoice in that, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And again, the blessings in the eternal state that are there for all believers, but those who are winner believers, the overcomers, will reap those benefits and blessings in the eternal state. And let's be qualified because we've worked in a manner worthy of our Lord. Then also in a subcategory of the worthiness, uh, get uh, three slides in regard to the pastor teacher because they too are commanded to operate and function worthy of the calling by which they have been called. And what is that? To preach and teach the word of God diligently and to be a good representation of the will and plan of God. And so first and foremost, in 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, 12, the teacher is to work diligently at studying and teaching, studying and teaching, so that they can pass to the church in an appropriate way as they are feeding the knowledge of Jesus Christ to the congregation. It says, so that you, talking about the congregation, would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, so that you, the congregation, would walk in a manner worthy of God. And that's what the pastor teacher is designed to do. Give you all the information necessary so that you can walk worthy of God. And so you can reap the blessings of time and eternity so that you can fulfill God's plan for your life. 
You see, if a pastor teacher is not feeding his congregation appropriately and not giving them the word that they need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is not doing his job, and he, as we're going to see in the next uh, couple of slides, are not worthy of their gift and the pulpit in which they have been given. And I can't tell you in the United States of America, uh, certainly up here in the Northeast, but uh, I think throughout our country, even down in the South, and uh, even in the, you know, the middle of the country, you know, we're seeing less and less good teachers of Bible doctrine. We're seeing less and less pastors teaching the Word of God consistently and diligently. So therefore, the people aren't being prepared in their soul to walk in a manner worthy of God. And it starts with the pastor, but then it goes down to the individual. But with that said, you can't blame it on the pastor teacher because we all have our own volition. And we all have our own volition. If that pastor teacher isn't teaching you the Word of God, get out of there. Because you're not going to go anywhere with that pastor. And you're not going to fulfill God's plan with that pastor. So if he's not teaching the Word of God, and I'm, I'm never going to say she because, uh, you know, you start with she right away and you know you're outside the will and plan of God because she should not be behind the pulpit. Another story for another day. Okay, so if he is not teaching the Word of God, again, you have a responsibility to guard your own soul and to get out of there and get to a place where you can learn the Word of God. Then we also see uh, in the book of uh, uh, 1 Timothy, in chapter 5, and we're going to see in verses uh, 17 and 18, it says the elders, talking about the pastor teachers, who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. That's what it says in 1 Timothy 5, 7, that uh, the congregation then has a reciprocal relationship back to the pastor teacher who is doing a good job of teaching them the word. And if the, the pastor teacher is feeding them as they should be fed spiritually, then the congregation has a responsibility to feed the pastor teacher materially. Okay, and make sure he has all the resources and assets materially so that he doesn't have to be distracted by going out and get another job, part time, full time, whatever the case may be. And he can focus on your soul by preparing and teaching the word of God. So again, congregations have a reciprocal uh, responsibility for the pastors who are worthy. And they're not just worthy of honor, but of double honor here. And again, don't just praise the pastor because he can't put food on the table with all your praise, okay? Can't feed the family with all your praise, okay? So if you're going to praise the pastor, you better make sure that he's got food on the table for his family. So again, that's the worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And then it says in verse five, uh, 18 in chapter 5, For Scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and a laborer is worthy of his wages. So two Old Testament and even New Testament principles of doctrine from the farming industry and the commerce industry. Again, if you have an ox and it is tilling your field or threshing uh, your grain, as it says here, the threshing aspect, you are not to muzzle the ox. You are to make sure that the ox can still feed while he is doing his work. And so as the ox is threshing the grain, you've got to allow him to eat some of that grain. Otherwise, he will not be able to do the job appropriately. So as the pastor teacher is threshing the Word of God and teaching the Word of God, you've got to make sure that he too has the means and op, uh, 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 mode to be able to survive so that he can teach you and not uh, have to, again, uh, be starved out because he will not be able to do the work that he otherwise needs to do. And then the other principle, a laborer is worthy of his wages. And God says many times, if we are going to be owners of business or uh, 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 captains of commerce, however you like to say that, you better make sure that you're treating your laborers fairly. 
and not trying to cheat them or swindle them uh, and uh, 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 treating them like, uh, you know, quote unquote, a slave, okay? Because a laborer is worthy of their wages. And if you say you're going to pay so much for the work that they do, you better pay them so much for the work that they do. And therefore, with the pastor teacher, he's a laborer. I'm a laborer for you. And the pastor teacher labors so that you can be worthy to walk in whites in the eternal state. And if the pastor is worthy of his wages, then you better make sure he gets his wages and not cheat him out or swindle him out or cheap him out, as it were, and then therefore hold back for yourself so you can have a good party life and instead, you know, uh, you let him suffer and uh, uh, have to, uh, uh, to wrangle and figure out how he's going to survive along with his family in order to provide you the work that he does. And the fact of the matter is that the pastor teacher who is typically doing a good job at teaching and preaching the word, they also have a heart for the congregation, which means they aren't concerned about the wages that they are making. So therefore, they can be taken advantage of very, very easily. Because people know, oh, they're going to do their job regardless of what we pay them, even if we cheap them out. And they're going to try to do everything possible so that, again, they can be doing their job applying their spiritual gift because they have a heart. And many people subconsciously take advantage of that because they know he's going to always be there and do his job regardless of whether he has to scrimp and scrape or scraggle Scraggle, if that's a word. Okay, it's a word, I know, but I don't know if it applies, but maybe it does. Okay, but he'll do whatever he has to do so that he can preach the Word of God because he has a motivation through the filling of the Holy Spirit to do just that. And that's what he's concerned about, preaching and teaching the Word of God to his congregation. And he's not concerned about the money. And he's going to leave the money up to the money and leave that up to God. But he's going to do everything possible. So don't take advantage of the goodwill of the pastor teacher and the kind heart and the loving heart that he has for his congregation. So in regard to all of that, as we see this word axios throughout the New Testament in its various forms and shapes and its applications, we see it applied to the pastor teacher. We see it applied to the congregation. But all of us, whether we're pastor or congregant, we all have a responsibility responsibility to walk worthy unto our Lord. And we all hope that we will be deemed worthy of our Lord because we have gone forward with positive volition in faith with the filling of the Holy Spirit to fulfill God's will and plan for our lives. We've had a fervency for the Word of God. We've had a fervency for a relationship with God. We've had a fervency for the furthering of the Word of God in our lives and in the lives of people around us. But as we understand, our worthiness is a grace gift by God because he's done all the work, he's done all the power, he's given us all the tools, the resources, and the assets. He's given us everything necessary. All we need to do is yield and apply by faith. And because he has provided us everything necessary, really in the end times, he's going to get all the glory. And even the resurrection body in the uniform of glory is not a reflection of our glory, but it's a reflection of the glory of Christ on us. And we'll have an opportunity to reflect either more of Christ or less of Christ, depending on whether we were deemed worthy here in this time. But this worthiness that we have, again, we don't get arrogant. We don't get big-headed about the, oh, I'm a great person. I'm all worthy and all this. Because that, too, is all by the grace of God. And that's what we see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, where it says, And they overcame him because the blood of the Lamb. What's this talking about? The tribulational saints who overcame the Antichrist. And again, the most uh, difficult and horrific time of human history to be a believer. And their lives are on the line. Their daily well-being is on the line because of their faith in Christ. But they overcame him. Again, the Antichrist and Satan. Because of what? The blood of the Lamb. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And because of the word of their testimony. Again, they kept preaching the gospel. They kept believing in the gospel. They kept faithful to the gospel. They kept going forward with the gospel. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. They did not love their life even when faced with death. 
So again, there's kind of a twofold aspect. They did not love their life, period. And so again, what does that mean? It's like, I don't love my life more than I love my God. Okay? And it's not about my life and the things I have in this world, the material things, and, you know, and, 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 uh, this thing or that thing, or whether I have this prestige or that prestige, or you know, this house or that house, or this car or that car. Okay? It's not about that. You know, if I get a car, I get a car. If I get a house, I get a house. If I don't, I don't. Okay? Again, they did not love their life above their relationship with God. They loved God first and foremost. And then whatever life God had for them, they were content with that. And they went forward in that. But now we take it up a notch, even when faced with death. So now it's more than just what you have in this world inside of Satan's cosmic system. Now it's your physical life, even when faced with death. When your life is on the line. In other words, when you are before the firing squad and they say, renounce Jesus Christ, or you're going to get a bullet right between the eyes. What are you going to say? Again, do you love your life more and say, no, 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 I don't love Jesus. I renounce Jesus. I renounce Jesus because I want to live. I want to live. Or do you say, I believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you want to fire that bullet, fire that bullet. And if God wants to take me home, amen, I get to go home. And if he wants to end it now, it ends now. But I know my God, if he wants me to go on, I will go on. He will stop that bullet before it penetrates and does its deed. Because God has a plan for me. So, these winner believers who are deemed worthy, these overcomers, and hopefully you're one of them, and if you don't feel that you've been one of them, get on their highway and start being one of them and be an overcomer. And do not love your life even when faced with death. And when you have that mental attitude, then you will be deemed worthy because the blood of the Lamb. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us all the power, resources, and assets to be overcomers. And Father, we just ask that you uh, either get us on that path or keep us on that path of being an overcomer so that we glorify you to the maximum. And one day we are deemed worthy because of your grace that has worked mightily within our lives. So Father, we thank you and we ask for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.